Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to go over testing for aneuploidy and Down syndrome. Now remember, aneuploidy is any time we are missing a chromosome or we have extra chromosomes. The most common of the aneuploidies is Down syndrome. Now, in this lecture, we're gonna focus more so on the various screening tests that we're gonna do throughout pregnancy. If you need a refresher on the specifics of Down syndrome, of Patau syndrome, Edwards, all those, make sure you check out the pediatrics, like pediatrics series, because in there we talk about genetic disorders. Okay, let's dive in. Let's start with our first trimester combined test. This is a test that we perform between 10 and 13 weeks plus six days gestation. And this is made up of three different components, maternal serum beta HCG, maternal serum pregnancy associated plasma protein A, that's called PAPPA, and nuchal translucency on ultrasound. This first trimester combined test is going to provide screening for a variety of genetic disorders, of course, including Down syndrome. Now, keep in mind, this is not a confirmatory test, but rather a screening test, and it's going to detect around 85% of Down syndrome cases. Now, positive screening for Down syndrome here in the first trimester combined test would include um, increased nuchal translucency, increased beta HCG, but decreased PAPPA. Now, a positive screening for both trisomies 13 and 18, so Patau and Edwards syndrome, Patau 13, Edwards 18, will show increased nuchal translucency, decreased beta HCG, and decreased PAPPA. Okay? Now, the advantages of the first trimester combined test includes the ability to screen for not only Down syndrome, but also trisomy 18 and 13, as well as the patient having opportunities to pursue accurate prenatal diagnostic testing earlier. Very important. The next screening we're going to discuss is the second trimester quadruple test. This is also known as the squad, as the quad screen. Now, this test is performed at 15 to 18 weeks plus six days gestation, ideally, but it can be performed as late as 22 weeks plus six days. Now, like the first trimester combined test, maternal serum HCG is measured, but rather than the serum pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and an ultrasound, the second trimester quadruple test relies entirely on serum biomarkers. So these four maternal, uh, these four uh, maternal serum biomarkers that we're going to look at are the alpha uh, serum AFP, alpha fetal protein, HCG, estriol, and inhibit A. The advantages here are that ultrasound is not required, and also as alpha fetal protein is measured, this also serves as a screening for neural tube defects. And in neural tube defects, of course, the AFP is typically elevated. Now, as for trisomies, Down syndrome, trisomy twenty one, will show a decreased AFP increased HCG, decreased estriol, and increased inhibin A. Trisomy 18 will demonstrate decreased AFP, decreased HCG, decreased estriol, but normal inhibin A. Trisomy 13 has all values on the quad screen in normal range. All right, now moving on to some of the diagnostic testing. There are two forms of invasive diagnostic testing. We have the chorionic villus sampling, and we have amniocentesis. So chorionic villus sampling can give a definitive karyotypic diagnosis. Now, this procedure is performed between 10 and 13 weeks gestation. And as you will recall, this overlaps a great deal with first trimester combined tests. Now, chorionic villus sampling can be performed when there are irregularities seen on the first trimester combined test, while other indications include patients over 35 years of age, a previous child with chromosomal or genetic disorders, a parent who is a carrier for chromosomal or genetic disorders, whether that is a parent who is a carrier of balanced chromosomal translocation, single gene genetic disorders, or two parents who are known to be recessive carriers, whatever it may be. Now, the way the sampling is performed is the clinician will take samples of the placenta with ultrasound guidance, either transabdominally or transcervically. These samples will then usually be initially evaluated using fluorescence in situ hybridization, FISH, followed by a microarray if this initial fish is normal, or a karyotype if the fish is abnormal. These microarrays or karyotypes are how a definitive genetic diagnosis can be obtained. Now, complications are associated with, with this procedure. They include rupture of membranes, pregnancy loss, vaginal bleeding, and fetal maternal hemorrhage. The next diagnostic test we need to look at is amniocentesis. Now, this is a procedure whereby amniotic fluid is obtained using a needle that is inserted transabdominally, and we aspirate the amniotic fluid. And this fluid, fluid will contain urine, secretions, as well as exfoliated cells from the fetus, which can be analyzed. 
Now, amniocentesis can also be used non-diagnostically to reduce amniotic fluid volumes in, in certain cases where that would be required. So if there's polyhydramnios, okay, that's probably your most uh, common reason. Again, samples initially will typically be evaluated using fish for fast results of aneuploidy, followed by a microarray if that fish is, is, is normal or a karyotype if it's abnormal. Now, complications associated with amniocentesis can include fetal loss. We can see direct or indirect fetal injury, leakage of amniotic fluid, chori amniotic separation, and introduction of bowel flora. All right, so those two procedures, the, the CVS and amniocentesis, they can provide a genetic diagnosis for the fetus uh, prior to birth. Now, there's another screening test that's used when the patient, when the pregnant patient declines invasive procedures. This is known as cell-free DNA screening. Now, the advantages of cell-free DNA screening is that it can be performed by drawing blood from the maternal circulation with no invasive testing required that would put the fetus at risk of injury or even demise. So cell-free DNA screening provides another useful bit of information when helping to determine the likelihood of aneuploidy. But again, it won't be the answer on the exam if you're asked how to definitively diagnose a chromosomal disorder. So false, uh, false positives and false negatives when we screen with cell-free DNA can still occur. So this is mostly performed just to determine likelihood. Now, there are enough fetal cells in circulation after about the 10th week of gestation. So we need the gestational age to be at least 10 weeks or later in order to perform the screening test. Now, indications for cell-free DNA uh, screening include abnormal ultrasound findings or abnormal serum screening tests that we would see in the first trimester combined or the second trimester qu uh, quadruple test. Additionally, maternal age over 35, a previous aneuploid pregnancy, or a parent known to have a chromosomal translocation would be additional indications to perform this cell-free DNA screening. Now, cell-free DNA screening is the most sensitive and specific screening option for Down syndrome for trisomy 18 and 13, so it's often employed for these high-risk groups, even though we can't make a definitive diagnosis with it. But again, it's not going to be your first choice if we want definitive diagnosis. All right, and some of the signs and symptoms, let's just talk about this real quick, just a quick review here. Uh, some of the signs and symptoms to look out for when it comes to Down syndrome. Now, this is not comprehensive, so make sure you refer to some other lectures if you need a more comprehensive look. Multiple organ systems can be affected in Down syndrome with lifelong sequelae and the development of further disease states as the patient progresses in age. But some signs and symptoms that can be present at birth that are seen at increased rates in children with Down syndrome include Head and neck abnormalities like epicanthal folds, upslanting palpable fissures, a flat nasal bridge, extra skin at the nape of the neck, and or a protruding tongue. Now, hand abnormalities including a transverse palmar crease, short broad hands, and or dysplasia of the middle phalanx of the fifth finger are all possible findings. We also want to look for cardiovascular defects such as complete AV septal defects, ventricular septal defects, or ASDs. These can all be seen. Though there are, of course, other less common defects that we need to associate, uh, but I wouldn't worry too much about those. They typically test you on the big ones. So the complete AV septal defect, VSD, ASD. Finally, a Down syndrome patient can be born with duodenal atresia or stenosis, something to keep an eye out for in the vignette. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the slide, there is a ton of info you need to know about Down syndrome as a whole. Uh, so if you're a little bit rusty on that and you want a deeper dive, make sure you go back, either reread your step one notes if you're... If you have our step one program, look at the, the notes on that, or you can go to the P's lectures and take a look at the genetic disorders. All right, let's do a content review, some content review questions. Uh, here's your first question. I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure it out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, you know what to do. Correct answer here is A. And our final question, I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back.
The correct answer here is D. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one. Thank you.